my name, uh, well, as you can see, so let's start with the topic. That's uh, my topic for today. Um, I uh, hope uh, you enjoy it. Basically, it, the audience for this topic um, is any developer who's looking to build a high throughput system, wants to monitor his apps on Cloud Foundry, is interested in significant load testing of those apps, and of course, anybody who ate the pancake breakfast this morning who's looking for a recovery area, please feel free to attend as well. My name is Dale Robinson. Um, I am the anchor for the ASICS project. The team I work on is an XP team consisting of eight developers. I work for uh, Arity, which is uh, a company uh, that uh, does the publisher and subscription processing for a number of companies you may have heard of, such as Allstate and um, Insurance. And the application itself is basically responsible for ingesting all of the sensor data for those companies. My previous uh, history, as it were, in terms of before I started out on Cloud Foundry and moved across uh, onto um, Pivotal's uh, implementation of it, was uh, Java Enterprise, uh, Java EE in particular, um, working on, as Justin mentioned previously, the <laughs> rapidly less useful uh, web sphere. So, in terms of the application that uh, we were, were writing and wanting to use, uh, called A6, one of the very first requests that we were given when, certainly when I joined the application or the application team, was to test and see whether or not the application was actually capable of ingesting the number of uh, messages being sent by the IoT devices. To that end, the first thing we had to do was obviously find some way to actually test the application. So, in short, we had an application and we had a six, but what we really wanted was a 10. We wanted to know that the performance of the application was suitable. Thanks for that laugh. I'm actually in two minds about this slide because uh, <laughs> quite simply put, when I first showed it to the marketing team, I suggested quite jokingly that, that maybe we should switch out Chris Hemsworth and myself and I should be the 10 and he can be the six. All I can say is that the laugh that I got from that was longer than the one we just heard. So. Okay, so moving on from that, in terms of the application itself, um, what we wanted it to be able to do was to deal with a significant number of concurrent requests, specified um, certainly by our customers as being somewhere in the region of 7,000 concurrent requests. Um, that was the biggest issue that we faced. And obviously, the only way you're going to know that you can do that is if you actually can generate that number of requests into your application and see what it does. So. We looked at various uh, you know, options internal to the company and obviously Arity as a company moving from a waterfall environment into a more agile process, um, it had its own internal testing teams. Um, and obviously one of those teams was a load testing team. But, excuse me. The problem that you always have with that scenario um, is that when you have a load testing team, you have to go through the usual processes of obtaining resourcing to help you with your testing, writing scripts, sitting down with those resources and explaining to them exactly what you need them to do. And obviously the time you have to book on the actual load testing environment and tools to ensure that you can actually do this processing. So we wanted to avoid all of that um, and make our lives a little bit easier and hopefully turn this around a little bit quicker. Um, so what we decided to do was to make use of the actual Cloud Foundry infrastructure that was available to us. Now, in Previous, uh, you know, environments, if you ever wanted to use, uh, you know, a server or anything like that, you always had to go through requisitions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and that was always a pain. It would take in a certain amount of time. The big benefit, obviously, that Cloud Priority provides out of the box is the ability to spin these things up automatically. So what we decided to do was to simply embed the actual uh, JMeter tool inside of a Spring Boot application and deploy that into Cloud Foundry and then use an endpoint to simply kick off the test. We weren't looking for a complete or detailed solution. We just wanted some way to push enough load into our application to prove that the application could deal with it. So if you look at the uh, screen on the left-hand side here is the very basic uh, program uh, in terms of uh, embedding Spring, uh, sorry, in, in terms of embedding JMeter into Spring. Um, you really only need three classes, the application class, the uh, 
property loader and the JMX processor. The Java processor was just uh, happened to be there when I was doing the screenshot, so unfortunately it got included. On the right-hand side, you can see the, uh, detail, the, the, the actual information that is held inside of this JMeter YAML file. Um, and it just really contains these three values which are then collected by Spring itself and injected into these uh, fields. Finally, the dependencies uh, 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 for this project are, are also quite small. You can see there's really only just the four. The only thing to be aware of is to the actual exclude module over here, which uh, prevents uh, Spring's logging, uh, causing any carnage with uh, JMeter's internal logging. In terms of getting JMeter itself to run, uh, all you need is these two uh, libraries. Uh, the Apache HTTP, uh, Apache JMeter HTTP and Apache JMeter Java uh, uh, JAWS. Once you have those in place, you can kick off the actual uh, JMeter uh, tool itself. Um, and what we decided to do is to actually use a JMX file, which you can obviously create quite easily using JMeter's own uh, uh, UI. So reading that in, using it to kick off the test, which we then kicked off simply with a curl command. This then is the endpoint as defined inside of the uh, Spring Boot application. Uh, you can see it uh, simply going to listen on slash JMX as the URL. Um, as I said before, kicking it off quite easily with a post call using curl. The internals of the, uh, pro of the program are quite simple. Uh, all of the information, if I step back one, all of the information that you see over here with regards to these property files are the actual internal configuration uh, files for um, JMeter itself. Uh, you can get those from either a local installation of JMeter or alternately, in the same way that uh, you can import these JMeter, Apache JMeter HTTP files, you can uh, look up the Apache JMeter config information and retrieve those files from there. So as long as we make those available on the class path as a resource, the application will load and will then kick off the JMX file that we also have specified within the application. This then was a nice, simple way for us to kick off any load tests. So once we got to this point, the good news was that we were able to kick off the load tests. The bad news was that we didn't have sufficient load, even though we were using Cloud Foundry, we didn't have sufficient load uh, running from that single application. The reason why, and the reason why we couldn't just have used our local machines ourselves anyway, was because of the fact that um, my team is based in the UK, the data centers for our company are based in the US, which meant that there was a horrible latency between those two um, continents whenever you try to run your load tests. So the easiest way was to simply embed the application in one of the data centers and then get you know, real information doing it that way. Unfortunately, deploying just the one application, what we found, and this is obviously going to differ based on your Cloud Foundry implementation or your Cloud Foundry um, uh, uh, platform, um, was that we certainly at that time couldn't increase the number of instances in terms of the so-called virtual users that JMeter allows you to use beyond, say, 500. The minute we went down that route, what would happen was uh, JMeter would basically crash out. So to hit our target of 7,000 users or uh, uh, simulated users, what we had to do is we needed to have 14 instances of the application deployed. The minute you go down the route, the route of having 14 instances of the application deployed for this type of problem, you run into one very significant issue very quickly, and that is orchestration. The reason why orchestration becomes such a, such a big issue is because the instances themselves are load balanced. So there's no easy way for you to send the message to tell the application to kick off without uh, uh, you know, some sort of trickery, really, because the load balancer will simply send the message just to one of the instances. So, how did we uh, get around that issue? Oh, I think I've jumped too far again. Um, at the time, uh, we were sitting on Pivotal Cloud Foundry version 1.6, and at that point, there was no way to directly invoke a instance. So we had to use a rather horrible hack, and the, 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 the horrible hack was simply to create a script and iterate through a name ad appending a number so that we would have a list of routes into the applications and we could then call those routes using another script. Keeping in mind that we weren't interested in kicking off the tests immediately uh, at this, or at this uh, specific configured time, something which you could do by simply updating your JMX file and importing it and running it the way you want to. But in our particular case, we were intending to run these tests for a sustained uh, amount of time and the easiest way to do that was to simply just kick them off and let them start running. We were running for hours and hours and hours. So the, you know, the milliseconds in between each uh, test suite kicking off didn't matter to us that much. Thankfully, there are now much uh, 
neater ways to uh, achieve the same thing. Um, as of PCF 1.7, and I believe in PCF 1.9, they've actually taken it a step further. In PCF 1.7, you could basically uh, use a curl command, a CF curl command, to retrieve information about the IP addresses of the instances. And then you can basically uh, pull those IP addresses out and obviously do exactly the same thing as what we were doing in a, in a, in a far more sensible way. And at least that allowed you to uh, uh, have you know, the instances themselves, in other words, to do the scaling within Cloud Foundry, rather than having to push up five, 10, 20 apps under different names. An even neater possible solution is to use, um, assuming that the option is available inside of your company if you're using Cloud Foundry, is to embed uh, the actual JMeter application inside of a Docker image and push that up and then uh, potentially do, you know, do the necessary steps to orchestrate that. I personally haven't done that, so I can't comment on it, but it certainly looks like a neater solution or an easy way to do it. So the great news was that we'd finally uh, managed to increase the load of our application, and we got to the point where, yes, um, the application itself was uh, running really, really uh, poorly, unfortunately. It's the only way to put it. We found out that the application itself could not deal with the load that we had. Why was there anything, you know, why, why, why was that a problem? What, the, what, what was the issue? Did we uh, have a really poorly written code? Was there some sort of underlying cause? Well, the application was developed. It worked, did everything correctly. Um, but it obviously followed the, 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 the maxim of no premature optimization. So we were quite happy because it meant from our perspective at least we had a lot of opportunity to, to actually tweak it further. So we started to investigate the options for finding where the actual problem was inside of our application. Now, at this point, it's, 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 it's probably very useful for me to describe the actual architecture and the reasons why the architecture becomes so important in load testing. The normal tests that we had in our application, things like our acceptance tests or our test, you know, our ordinary unit tests, really they, they're only interested in the, the actual result that you're getting. So if you make the acceptance test call, you get a result back and basically it says that yes, your code is working exactly as you want. But it's not really telling you very much about how the code executes in a live environment. And Again, as I said, our, my team was UK based, so if we try to run this application from the UK, going across the water, immediately any monitoring that we did using a tool like uh, Visual VM would highlight the fact that there was some sort of uh, database, uh, you know, the, the application was database constrained, which may have been the case, but unfortunately, because of the fact that it was reaching across the Atlantic, was quite often an artificial representation. So what we really, really wanted to do was to be able to actually monitor the application inside of uh, uh, Cloud Foundry itself. And to that end, these are the steps that you would need to do if you wanted to do that yourself. It's actually quite easy. Um, I've given the example here using Pivotal's Cloud Foundry, but the reality, I, I, I did a quick check and I had a look at the Bluemix setup. The, the, the actual instructions are universal to any Cloud Foundry application, so you should be able to do this if you're using Bluemix. Um, I have included a link at the end of the presentation, uh, slide deck, if you uh, are inclined to go and look at a website that I found to do it. But anyway, let me press on with the Pivotal uh, version. So, using the Pivotal version, there's only three real steps that you need to take. The first step is to actually enable JMX process, uh, the, the, the ability to perform JMX calls into the, into the application. Second step is to create an SSH tunnel so that uh, JMeter or your kit or uh, JProfiler, whichever tool you want to use, can actually reach into the container and connect to the container and start to monitor it. And obviously the final uh, step that, with regards to the, 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 the process is to actually establish that connection from JMeter into the application. So, if we look at the steps that are certainly defined over here, um, just to cover it off in case you're curious, the CFSSH step in the middle there, the, the dash, N, dash N, dash T, dash L, all that's really telling uh, the, 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 the container is that it doesn't need to open this up in any other form other than headless mode. In other words, you're not gonna get a presentation of the screen, so you don't have a TTY that comes up. And the uh, uh, container shouldn't expect an incoming command. It's literally just a pipe into it. Uh, the 5000 uh, port number is something that's defined in the Java build pack, so uh, basically all you're trying to do is link your local port to the port in uh, your actual container. So here's the next step of the process, where basically you're now trying to add the JMS connection into um, the container. Uh, handily, we used uh, Visual VM because, again, uh, we were trying to avoid the pain of having to go through a procurement process, which is inevitable if you want to use something like JProfiler or um, your kit. Um, 
we decided that it would just simply be much simpler if we made use of the free tool, and if we needed to, we could fall you know, into the, 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 the process of trying to get the necessary resources to buy a, a, a product. As it turned out, we didn't need to go very much further. V Visual VM was actually quite useful and quite capable. So on screen, you can see the, step, the, the initial step to uh, open up a JNX connection. All you need to do then is specify the actual localhost port that you want to use. After you've established the associated uh, uh, connection uh, from the command line using the CFSSH command uh, shown previously, and once you click on the connection in Visual VM, you should be presented with a screen very similar to this. Now, you will notice that on this slide I've highlighted the uh, heap dump button. The reason I've highlighted that is because unfortunately, when you monitor things inside of the application, uh, the pro biggest problem you have is that not all of the features are available as they would normally be if you're running the application, well, if you're running Visual VM locally. Specifically, and probably the biggest one that's missing is heap dump. Basically, if you want to make use of heap dumps in Cloud Foundry, there are a couple of extra hoops that you need to uh, go through to get uh, an actual heap dump out of the container. So I'll cover off the actual issue with regards to why heap dumps are you know, such a pain, but in the, in, in, initially I'm going to talk through the two options that we used to actually get around the problem. And then uh, on the, well, four slides from now, I'll explain exactly what the heap dump process is doing and why it causes such issues. So the first way you can uh, access the heap dump profile or the heap dump uh, 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 files is simply to use the mbean method in Visual VM. So if I step back, you will see in the middle of the screen over here, there's a button called mbeans. You are simply clicking on that and you should be presented with a screen similar to this. If you navigate to the comm sun management uh, section of the uh, list on the, shown on the left hand side here, and you go to the hotspot diagnostic class, there's a method that is exposed called dump heap. The first parameter of this method is the actual name of the file. So all you need to do is specify the name of the file as you want it to be in terms of uh, what you want to use. And the second one is a flag which indicates whether or not you want it to only save uh, and dump uh, live objects or if you want to dump everything, including items that are potentially not available or, or being garbage collected. Another operation, although this one is available, for some reason I managed to confuse myself when I looked at it initially, is uh, the thread dump. You can actually run this from some Visual VM, but I'm highlighting it here anyway, just uh, because the slide back was basically built before uh, uh, I, I found the uh, fact that you could run it directly. So this shows the thread print command. Again, if you just take out the string array argument on the right-hand side over here and you hit, uh, run the command directly, you will basically be able to produce a thread dump. The second mechanism is to, and this obviously assumes that you're using Spring, is to use the Spring Boot actuators. First, you need to confirm that they are enabled and sensitive. The reason why I highlight that is because different versions, I think it was version 1.4 uh, of Spring Boot, um, basically defaulted these to be unavailable, whereas previous versions had made them available out of the box. So if you want to make them available, uh, you, you actually have to go into your, either your application properties or your application YAML and set the associated flag. Um, once you've done that, you should be able to uh, simply call into your application and specify the associated URL that you see or qualify, complete the URL. And when you hit enter on, uh, at that point in the browser, the actual application will work. I will say this, um, at the end of this process, I'm hoping I've got enough time to do it. Um, I will actually go through, uh, or at least I'll load an application and just show you how these work. If you need more information, certainly the Spring documentation is very, very useful. There are plenty of endpoints that are not being described here, but these are the four that I found to be most useful in terms of trying to solve problems. Right, so in, 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 to, to, to come back to the issue around heap dumps, the, the real problem is the fact that when you request a heap dump, what happens is that the heap dump is saved into the container. Okay, so you actually have to increase the disk space that you have available on your container or else your heap dump doesn't work. Not only that, when you use the mbeam mechanism, you actually have to log into the container to find the file and then copy it out. And the only way, well, the way I, I did that was to use SCP. It, it works perfectly well, but unfortunately, it's, it's just that little bit more clunky, a little bit more difficult to do. I found the Spring Actuator mechanism much, much easier to use because what it'll do is it'll actually do the dump for you and then it'll copy out and gzip the file and drop it onto your local hard drive 
uh, making it all that little bit easier, just a little bit uh, more useful. Reasons for using one over the other, well, the, the only real reason I could see you using the MBeans mechanism is because of the fact that uh, maybe you've ported a G application into Cloud Foundry, or you're not running Spring Boot specifically. So as far as the journey in terms of the A6 application that uh, we deployed, we now had a, a situation where we could certainly create the load we needed to prove that our application was or wasn't able to achieve its objectives, and we'd now figured out a way to look inside of those containers and prove that, you know, or at least look at what the issues are and identify the problems that we found. Once we'd found those, we obviously now started to look at what we could do to try and fix them. So, as a person who's coming from a background in a Java EE uh, uh, enterprise uh, background, basically, um, what I can tell you, to you is the big lesson we've learned is just how useful and interesting uh, microservices are in terms of solving particular problems, especially in Cloud Foundry. Um, the reason why I'm highlighting that is if you've ever tried to connect to an application, and probably one of our microservices is very useful to highlight this point, um, one of the microservices we had basically only had four classes in it. But if you connected with um, Visual VM to that application, you'd see that there were over 10,000 classes loaded. Now, one of the biggest issues that you tend to have is that when you've got these large, uh, shall we say, monolith applications, the, the problem is all those edge cases, the bits where you're interacting with either the G container or you're interacting with even, in this case, uh, Tomcat, because Spring Boot obviously has Tomcat embedded in it, um, you run into all of these issues where something weird happens between your application and the code. And the big benefit that we found with microservices, um, apart from surprising performance benefits, was just that it allowed us to think of the function that the code was performing in much, much simpler terms. And not only that, gave us more control in terms of uh, uh, fine-grained control around the number of instances we needed to actually perform the necessary work that each service was providing. So the A6 application initially, um, it wasn't a particularly complex application in, in, in terms of the code itself, um, but a lot of the endpoints that we had were all uh, embedded in really one application. So when we started to do an investigation and to, you know, where the performance blockers were, what we found was if we broke out certain of these components into their own microservices and embedded them behind a RabbitMQ um, uh, queuing, well, RabbitMQ queues, we were able to uh, spin up you know, and pr provide that fine-grained control I mentioned earlier more effectively when it read off those queues and pushed it downstream to either our customers or onto databases, et cetera. So that led to a more distributed architecture uh, for our entire application. So basically what we had was we had the endpoints uh, defined at the beginning or at, at the entry point of the system, the actual API. That would then dump information onto various queues. Uh, each of these blocks that are listed here are essentially um, separated by queues. So where we wanted to save data to the database, for example, the API would write onto a rabbit queue. The benefit of writing onto the rabbit queue is obviously that the rabbit queues are not indexed, so there's no constraint issues. So they tend to perform a little bit faster than RDMSs. And you could just throw a lot of data at them. And then using a listener to read off the rabbit queue, you could dump the um, data onto the database in your own time and obviously give yourself the fine-grained control you might need or want um, in terms of scaling up the, the requisite number of instances, either during peak periods or um, uh, you know, as needed. The other big benefit, obviously, of putting rabbit queues in between these components was simply that uh, it provided a buffer in situations where something went wrong or went down. Things would write into the rabbit queue and you could always recover from the situation a little bit later by you know, applying whatever fix was necessary, bringing up more instances, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, finally, we, we basically had a situation where most of our problems in terms of performance were resolved by using these microservices. However, the, the, the two biggest ones that we uh, had issues around were specifically our persistence mechanism and uh, our downstream customers in terms of pushing down to them. So, from their perspective, we had to investigate a few more options to try and get their shall we say, the speed of uh, up to scratch, because ultimately um, they weren't able to you know, meet the target that we had been set, which was obviously the 7,000 concurrent messages a second. So to that end, we, rely, we, we, we went back to uh, some of the more interesting, or more, well, one of the more useful uh, spring annotations, which is the add async annotation. Um, 
some warnings around using that async annotation. In our particular case, because we're processing a lot of IoT sensor data, um, at the moment I think we're pushing well over 100 million messages a day. And uh, what we're seeing there is that when you've got a, you know, the, the, the law of large numbers comes into play. This, this is really data that our data scientists in the company use to do analysis to, you know, for, for whatever, the, you know, whatever data scientists do, basically. Um, and quite simply, if we lose one or two of those uh, sensor messages, it doesn't really matter that much. You know, the law of large numbers is just basically that there's so much data coming in, one or two messages lost aren't going to cause any problems. So we didn't have to be too concerned about um, the actual uh, issues around using the async annotation, um, but your, your, your mileage will obviously vary. So these are the, some of the things that you'd need to keep in, uh, in mind if you do decide to go down this route. Um, the thread pool, firstly, the thread pool and the queue that is, uh, it, it's using is, are essentially unconstrained. So if you don't uh, define limits for that under the async uh, process by defining your own uh, 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 thread, uh, uh, ex well, executor pool, you will definitely run out of memory and it will explode. So uh, definitely something to keep in mind when you go down this route. Another thing is that if you look at the applications that we defined, um, when we'd written the, 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 the RabbitMQ listener services, what we had was, on the one hand, we had an application that was listening to an incoming uh, uh, input-output device which was obviously going to be relatively slow. And on the other side of the application, if we take the persistence uh, process, it was writing, writing to a database. Both instances, uh, in both scenarios, what you had was a synchronous application before we put this in. And that, because it was synchronous, it meant it was very, very slow. It was basically waiting for the read to happen and it was waiting for the write to happen before it would do the acknowledgement back to the rabbit queue to say, look, this message has now been processed, we can get rid of it. So what we did was we inserted the async process literally right slap bang in the middle of the application. So the listeners were able to read much faster. They would offload the, uh, uh, the message that needed to be saved or processed onto um, the uh, uh, second part of the process, which was the asynchronous thread that was running uh, uh, independently of the, 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 the listener. And by doing that, the performance improvements we saw in, in one particular instance, for example, um, we had a test that before that was running in the vicinity of one minute and 30 seconds to complete the test, it had dropped to below 15 seconds. So definitely a, a, a very useful uh, performance improvement. But the biggest issue that you obviously have when you decouple your reading and your writing is in, in the scenario that I just described is that it basically acknowledges the message as being received before it actually has been processed. So if you are writing something similar, you need to be aware that you need to take certain precautions uh, to save that data or do something about it if there is a problem on your application side. Um, the other issue, of course, is error handling. One of the biggest problems that it, is that if you are throwing errors in the second thread, obviously there's no link between thread A and thread B. There's no easy way for the two to communicate with each other, so you need to do something uh, uh, you know, to, to manage that side of the process. We uh, ended up using the error advice controller mechanism from Spring. Um, it worked uh, perfectly well for our needs, um, but just to highlight that uh, in, in terms of what uh, you guys are doing. And I think I'm running a little bit close on time here, so I need to pick up the pace. Um, one of the things that we uh, thought we uh, would ever look at, or when I say thought we would ever look at, I suppose I'm really blaming myself here because uh, it's inevitable that as developers we think that those guys from uh, uh, Spring or Hibernate or whatever may not know what they're doing and that I can do a better job, really. So obviously I bumped my head on this one quite extensively. Um, and I would say that uh, the general defaults that you're gonna find for things like Tomcat and pretty much any other framework are probably gonna be um, a pretty good fit for your application. I can tell you that after we uh, tinkered with these uh, uh, settings, um, we actually reverted back to the standard defaults because they worked for us. They, you, they, they definitely were things that you could tweak and improve in certain areas, but ultimately they were unnecessary. So the defaults here are 200 threads, 10,000 connections, um, 200 worker threads, basically these are the threads inside of Tomcat that will actually do the processing of the incoming messages. Tomcat will accept 10,000 connections uh, it, itself, and there's an additional OS component uh, where the OS is requested to st store a queue uh, of messages, which defaults to 100. Of course, this queue is not guaranteed. It's, it's, it's really up to the OS in terms of uh, whether or not it does or doesn't do it the way that Tomcat wants. And then finally, the, there are 100 keep alive requests.
If you want to tinker with it, here's some sample code. Again, um, I have included the links to, uh, well, basically the application that runs uh, this code. So if you want to download the application, it's just on GitHub. Uh, you can obviously play around with it and see what it does and monitor it through Visual VM yourself. So uh, in terms of what you can see over here, this is a, the, this literally the nuclear option for configuring the Tomcat uh, server in the underlying Spring Boot application. Um, the information over here, certainly the first four that you see there are all around uh, setting up the, 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 the values that you saw for the server defaults. So the 200 threads is the uh, maximum, the maximum connection, oh, sorry, the max threads value. The acceptor, the max connections, in this case, is set down from to, to 1,000 from 10,000, and the backlog value equates to Tomcat's accept count value, which sets the information inside of the OS. At the bottom, you can see the uh, keep alive requests. Um, the reason why that might be useful to you is because of the fact that if you've got a lot of concurrent requests and none of them are actually being maintain, maintaining their connections, it's, it's, it's quite easy just to shut them down. You obviously have the higher uh, initial connection costs of uh, uh, an incoming message going on to uh, Tomcat, but you have the benefit of not sitting around waiting for um, the actual uh, connection to time out if the client is not closing the connection properly. Um, one last area of configuration, because we used uh, Rabbit, uh, was the actual um, configuration of the Rabbit connection queues. This one actually did give us a, a, a benefit, um, simply uh, because of the fact that Rabbit uh, only supplies one connection in 25 uh, channels when you uh, specify it um, you know, as, as default connection. The reason why that caused a problem in our application was actually, again, because of our application's own fault. The way in which our application was working is it was reusing this connection over and over and over. And once we broke out the application into the microservices described before, the, 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 the need for this configuration actually reduced. So quite simply, you know how to configure it, and as I've already alluded, you probably shouldn't. Um, the, 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 sorry, the uh, actual defaults, as I said before, are really, really good. Again, I reiterate, you know, we actually reverted back after tinkering around with these things. Um, we reverted back to the default settings and they work perfectly well. Last uh, bit of pain that we experienced was uh, around uh, security-driven development, which uh, I can only say um, caused us um, some entertainment. I was very popular on this day. So we basically tuned the application. We got it to the point where it was uh, running really, really well. And what we decided to do was um, uh, run a full test, but in this particular case, we wanted to run it where it was passing in bad data. So that killed Cloud Foundry, or rather, it didn't kill Cloud Foundry, it ran foul in our uh, system because of a security policy which said that if we were sending, a, if, if it got too many requests that led to certain errors, the actual security policy in the company would assume that what was happening was a denial of service attack, and as a, uh, a, a protection mechanism, it actually blocked any more incoming requests. Unfortunately, it blocked all of the incoming requests for everybody who wanted to use Cloud Foundry. So, as I say, I wasn't very popular that day. Uh, finally, uh, almost the last slide, these are the commands that uh, I was referring to earlier. So if you are in Cloud, if you're using anything about PCF Cloud, uh, or PCF version 1.7, you can use this curl command to uh, get the information about the IP addresses for the underlying instances, if you want to hit those instances directly for any reason. Um, additionally, just for your own awareness, it is absolutely super simple to swap out Tomcat for Jetty or Undertow. Again, the Spring documentation deals with it quite extensively. Um, it's literally four lines of code, and you can switch to any uh, uh, you know, alternate servlet container. A couple other things to be aware of, uh, the async rabbit template and the async rest template, also again, Spring uh, uh, constructions. Um, they may make your life easier. Uh, I had a look at these and some of the work that we actually landed up doing ourselves, once these came out, we could actually use these instead or in preference to it. And the last one, which we've actually found quite useful just from a learning perspective, is PCF Dev. Again, available on the Pivotal website. Um, it uh, just means that you can actually deploy stuff locally on your own machine. It reacts in very much the same way as a real Cloud Foundry. And it gives you the option of uh, embedding an application and just running it and tinkering around it for yourself. Uh, these are the links that I referred to. The actual slide deck is uh, posted up onto shed.com, shed which uh, means that if you just log into there, you can actually pull it down and you'd have access to these links um, if you want to have a look at uh, any of it further, including the code I was referring to. 
Thank you very much.